In Africa, we have 34 countries that have pledged to restore their lands, and all of them have commitment, millions of hectares that they want to restore, which is good. Some of them, and there are different level of implementation. Some of them have started with projects, others are even yet to start. So we want to use the case of Malawi, which is one of the champions, I would say, in restoration. Welcome to Growing Impact a podcast by the Institute of Energy and the Environment at Penn State. Each month, Growing Impact explores the projects of Penn State researchers who are solving some of the world's most challenging energy and environmental issues. Each project has been funded through a seed grant program that's facilitated through IEE. I'm your host, Kevin Sliman. Malawi is a sub-Saharan African nation in the southeast section of the continent with a population of about 20 million people, The country is heavily dependent on agriculture. In fact, four out of every five Malawians work in the agriculture sector, and they're dependent on the land. However, the land in Malawi is deteriorating. Forest loss, soil erosion, and unsustainable farming practices are depleting the land. Still, Malawi is a leader in terms of forest landscape restoration. The country has pledged to restore thousands of square miles of land, With the goal of informing restoration policy and practice, a research team looks to measure restoration efforts and understand what those efforts are achieving, including ecological changes, socioeconomic benefits, and governance improvements. Hello to everybody. Um, My name is Ida Genotin. I am an assistant professor in the geography department at Penn State University. I'm a human environment geographer and mostly interdisciplinary trained environmental social scientist. Um, my research, right, um, I focus on interlinked environmental and climate change issues that affect mostly forests and agricultural systems. And uh, in in that, I looked at um, the governance aspect, the institutional, social, cultural, and economic dimensions of environmental degradation and resource conservation and restoration now. All that in the context of climate in a, in a climate changing uh, climate context so also looking at how um, these affect adaptation and mitigation but mostly in sub-saharan african countries so my name is tom uh, i'm an assistant professor of uh, of uh, multifunctional landscapes so is this your landscape ecology uh, so i'm an assistant professor in the college of agricultural science uh, department of ecosystem science and management um, so I'm using uh, remote sensing data to understand how global change has affects the ecosystem function and services of uh, global forest and other ecosystem types. Hello, everyone. I'm Judith Kamoto from Malawi. I work with the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I'm a development sociologist by training but I also studied forestry in its entirety. So currently I'm a college director for Bunda College of Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I'm an associate professor of forestry and rural development. My research revolves around community forestry, governance issues in forestry, forest landscape restoration, gender, climate change, Almost I'm a jack of all trades, but focusing on natural resource management. I'm trained as a social and natural scientist, so I combine uh, those two in my uh, field of research. This project is focusing on sub-Saharan Africa, and it's looking at environmental degradation. Could you help me understand what's happening across sub-Saharan Africa in terms of environmental degradation? Environmental degradation is really a problem in Africa, and particularly Malawi. Most of the natural resources that remains on the continent is being degraded either for social or economic activities. Most of the 
three species that we have that are of value. They are being cut for timber to provide wood to the industry. So the countries like uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, Cameroon, uh, that belt still has rainforests in Ghana and some parts of West Africa. But those countries that have a savanna type of forest or miombo forest in Southern Africa, um, most of that is being degraded because of the communities dependent on those forests. So they depend on forests for livelihood. Um, so firewood for cooking, charcoal for cooking and heating, fruits, even wildlife depend on the same forests like elephants, they will browse on trees and elephants Normally they are very destructive in their sense of um, browsing. So you find that because of that, most of the environment is being degraded. But as again, not just looking at forests, but environment in general, our way of farming is also degrading the soils that we have. Most of the soils are very infertile because they've been farmed for a very long time using inorganic fertilizers. So it's now that people are talking of using organic uh, fertilizers so that then the structure of the soil can improve. But because we have also lost vegetation through uh, deforestation or forest degradation, whenever it rains, there's quite a lot of runoff and uh, runoff carries with it the soil to the rivers and the rivers are polluted because of that runoff. So um, it's estimated that in Malawi alone, we lose about 70 tons of, of, of uh, soil every rainy season. Environmentally, its water is polluted because of the soil. The soil itself is degraded. The forests are degraded because of livelihood support. And in addition, the air is polluted environmentally because our agriculture relies on um, um, burning the residues when we are trying to um, start making ridges in readiness to plant crops. So we we'll put fire to those residues and uh, that also pollutes the, the, uh, the air, of course, uh, because of the trees are gone in most parts of the cities there's also a lot of um, dust and the air is polluted. But the worst enemy environmentally that we are facing at the moment is also uh, management of um, waste. So management of waste, bottles, plastic bottles, uh, plastic um, carrier bags, we have not moved yet into um, the organic um, type of uh, carrier bags. There is quite a lot of uh, environmental degradation. If I may put it in short, these have emphasized on Malawi, but I think they cut across the continent. That's completely true. Judy just surveys uh, the whole lot of issues that we have as in environmental degradation across of Southern Africa, giving specific example from Malawi. But if I come back to the agricultural and forestry sector, like she said, we have evidence of the still declining uh, forest rate of forest loss, and uh, it now is no longer uh, subjective because we have uh, tools that are measuring that forests are, are re we are really losing forest the rate of forest de um, de both degradation and deforestation. Uh, in terms of the drivers. I want to um, also add to what uh, Judith said. She mentioned timber, right? Timber used for um, wood. We also have, um, especially for Sub-Saharan Africa and, and low-income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, small-scale agric agriculture is um, 
understood as a tribal deforestation and also the, um, the reliance on charcoal as energy source, so biomass-based energy, which is also um, putting pressures on forests. So, but one thing that we tend to emphasize is that those drivers uh, of deforestation or that type of deforestation is not permanent, which means there is potential to reverse the tendency and it's, it, they don't lead to permanent deforestation. Are there any other thoughts about why it's occurring across sub-Saharan Africa? Any other thoughts about environmental degradation? Why is it happening? I think for sub-Saharan Africa, largely is because of um, the socioeconomic situation in which most people uh, find themselves. So the levels of poverty are high that um, the only way out to any income is through forest products, but the forest products that can earn them more money is not the non-timber forest products uh, like fruits, but the actual wood. And that's why there's um, quite a lot of cutting for firewood because um, they can take that firewood to urban areas for sale to earn a little bit of income. And charcoal is the most usable form of energy in urban areas. And where you have these forests uh, very close to urban areas or cities, then these local communities, even those from the urban, they go and stay and cut and bring the charcoal to urban or cities to earn income. So whether it's the subsistence agriculture that they rely on, because the soils are degraded, they will need inorganic fertilizers. They are not cheap. So they will need a hectare and hectare of, of uh, forest uh, to make three bag, bags of charcoal, uh, which would earn them maybe half the price of one bag of fertilizer which is not enough for one hectare or half a hectare of, of uh, maize or corn. So yeah, it's the levels of poverty that are really driving um, deforestation and also population growth. Most of the Sub-Saharan African countries, um, the population is really growing fast and also um, maybe education levels for Malawi also, that is also a factor. The majority of Malawians live in rural areas and they are not educated. So interventions that will bring or reverse environmental degradation also require people who can comprehend their capabilities, but most of the population is, is not educated. The things that are happening because of the degradation Again, we we talked a bit about we're we're kind of touching on these things, but I don't know if there are more specific, either specific examples you'd like to talk through about what is being impacted by the degradation of the land. I mean, obviously, people are very impacted by the degradation of the land. Are there other things that you would love to bring that, that you would like to bring up because uh, due to that degradation? Yeah. So. Um, from all those things that we pointed out as being the drivers of deforestation or even um, deforestation happening or environmental degradation happening, once you understand that people live uh, out of those resources, you then understand that when those resources are being degraded, then people are impacted. So livelihood of people, especially people living in rural areas, are impacted by environmental degradation, be it forest being deforestation, uh, land degradation, soil uh, erosion, all of that. And uh, because 
in sub-Saharan sub African countries are still, um, their economy are still rural. When I'm, what I mean by that is that they're still um, um, based, I mean, yeah, the, the economic activities are from the primary sector, which is agriculture, forest uh, products. So, but those are the one being impacted by, by environmental degradation. So then those um, livelihoods are really um, um, impacted as well. We That's also right. have biodiversity. So yes. habitat, I mean, we, we, we lose biodiversity, be it uh, plant biodiversity or animal biodiversity, because the habitat of those um, um, beings are being lost with degradation, with deforestation. So that's also another element. I think, Tom, you wanted to add to that? Yes, I was just talking about the biodiversity. So mm -hmm. basically, every single species group, like uh, small mammals, birds, and other like large mammals, they will be under the impacts of climate warming. So some species can move around. They can find shelters in different places. But habitat degradation kind of uh, remove those shelters. So they won't be able to find places that can mitigate climate warming impacts. So those will, would have a huge impact on their like life life for, uh, like, like life history at different, like how they can uh, raise their off, off, offsprings, how they can increase their population abundance. So those will have a large impacts. And then for habitat degradation also will influence the quality of their forest or their shrubland. So if you, um, the degradation of soil will uh, will cause a phenomenon called uh, woodland enrichment. So basically all those uh, good quality shrubland will be replaced by grassland. So which means they will lose lots of uh, habitat for different uh, variety of uh, community that the, the forest and shrubland should support. Could you discuss and tell us about what forest landscape uh, restoration is? And what does it hope to accomplish or what does it look to accomplish? So there is a whole history with what is now packaged as forest and landscape restoration. Um, but I will just um, go with the, the current definition that we have for it, which is um, an approach to restore and reclaim degraded ecosystems um, toward uh, bringing back the uh, ecological functionalities that are important for both human well-being but also ecological well-being. And unpacking a little bit more is that if we we um, it's about any types of restoration activities that uh, can help us to restore the ecological um, status, the biophysical uh, aspect of a landscape, but also the ecosystem services on which people depend. So it's, it has not only a natural component, which is the restoration of the ecological the habitat and, uh, and other bi biodiversity aspect, but also some social outcomes that are um, important to incorporate. And um, we also tend to, in, in, a, in a climate change lingo, we say forest landscape restoration is also a natural climate solution because um, what we expect to have from forest landscape restoration is also meant to support adaptation and mitigation, mitigation in the in the way that um, forest landscape restoration can help us to increase carbon sequestration in forests if forests are back, or uh, in soil if soil soil are, are back are restored. So, but it is a means to many ends. So, it's it's um, 
an intervention or a suite of intervention, a package of intervention, depending on the context where you are, whether tree planting, whether assisted natural regeneration, whether land and water conservation uh, um, um, practices, what we package as sustainable land management. So the interventions that fall under forest lands restoration are various, and there is not just a one size fit all um, as tree planting. And most importantly, it has to not only um, achieve ecological outcomes, but also social outcomes. I just want to emphasize the point that the benefits are many. The benefits to the ecosystem, the benefits to social beings, benefits to cultural or religious, especially this side of the continent, these things matter a lot. So they are, there's quite a variety of benefits that um, we derive from uh, restoration. And most importantly, what she mentioned about a restoration is a means to adaptation to climate change as well as a mitigation to climate change, which is a global problem. About the regeneration part, so we can use remote sensing to monitor the progress of regeneration through time, but we cannot, you know, we can guide it. The remote sensing approach can guide which places is easier to regenerate the forest. But in terms of uh, initialize the plan, we still need so we need we need the policy on the ground instead of using remote sensing. Remote sensing can just be a tool to monitor the process, but not the the one to initialize the whole process. Mm -hmm. That's that's my take. What does climate change look like in Malawi? So climate change in Malawi um, manifests itself through the rainy season that we have. Um, we have observed that the onset of the rains have shifted over time. Uh, we used to have a beginning of the rainy season in October of every year, but now we have the rains in December. So there's late, late onset of the rains. Sometimes it's as late as early January. But we only have three months of rain to make agriculture happen mm. because our agriculture is mostly land fed, it's not irrigation. And it's not that we don't have rivers that we can do irrigation, but irrigation is expensive, it's only affordable to a few. So with rain, late onset of the rains, and sometimes the cessation of the rains is also early. So a normal rainy season is three months, four months maximum. But sometimes we have three months. What does that mean if you have late onset of the rain and early cessation, and in the midst of it, you have droughts? or dry spells, it means that productivity of the land is not what you expect. The yields are very minimum. And uh, Malawi is an agro-based country. So we rely on, the, on, the, on agriculture. So if we don't have the rains that we rely on because of climate change, then that's a problem. It means that go, people will go hungry, they'll be famine mm -hmm. in that year. So uh, within a four-month period of rainy season, we, we really don't want to see droughts. Mm -hmm. But that's a manif manifestation of climate change. We don't want to see dry spells uh, because that's a manifestation of climate change. But we see them. And these days we see them more frequent. The other phase of climate change within the same period is that sometimes we have too much rain 
or okay, if it's too little, maybe it's drought or it's dry spells, mm. but it, too much rain will result in flooding. Mm. And um, for the past 10 years, every rainy season, we have had a disaster, which is as a result of the rainy season being um, in progress, either through cyclones, like this year we had Cyclone Freddy, which came around March towards the end of the rainy season, but it was very destructive. That is something that we cannot plan for, but it's something that is coming with the winds and with whatever is happening in the Indian Ocean, and we just get the effects of it. But we rely on the on the on the winds themselves to bring us rain, because if they don't bring us rain, then uh, we are in problems. So, to me, I would say that um, climate change in Malawi really is very vivid during the rainy season. But it's also hot. And um, in certain districts where it's not hot as it is used, it used to be, and now it's getting hotter. And um, because of that, diseases like malaria, because um, uh, they like warm areas, but also wet, you see an increase in those vector diseases that uh, either uh, come in because of um, the temperature changes. And um, also the other thing is that now it's the cold season. Our cold season in the past uh, used not to be very cold, uh, but now this is July, it will be drizzly. And um, yeah, we are now putting on winter jackets, like um, in, in in template regions. So uh, it's something that a, a person of my age would say we used not to do that. But uh, yeah, we can also see it in temperature in terms of how cold it has become. Uh, sometimes the minimum temperature early in the morning is nine degrees. We never used to have nine degrees temperature before. Yeah, but... The, the manifestation is really in the rainy season. Let's talk about the project. What is the project focusing on and what does it look to do? Yeah, so we were talking about forest landscape restoration, right? So in Malawi, as in many other countries, um, there are interventions. So what like projects implementing different forest landscape restoration interventions. Um, having studied how um, what is forest landscape restoration in the past, and now we have actual projects on the ground doing implementation, our question here is to understand what they're actually achieving. And uh, taking Malawi as a country case study, we want to understand what restoration is achieving on the ground, if any. And when we mean what is it achieving, we say restoration is about ecosystem, it's about people, so the social, but also it's about changing different institutions that are part of the governance that um, helps to manage those resources. We want to understand all of that to keep informing restoration as a policy, uh, whether it's it's not that it is worth, it is worth restoring, but are we achieving what we are expecting? That's important. So one way of doing that is to go and measure different types of indicators. Now, there are a bunch of indicators that restoration, restoration implementers look after, but they also uh, overlook other indicators, especially uh, the social indicators um, and, and also the institutional changes. So this project will not, unlike what many thinks about restoration, oh, 
the landscape will be restored. So we're going to look at the ecological changes. We're going to look at the biophysical changes. We're going to look at carbon sequestration of POC. We will look at all of those and we will add the social outcome. We will define what indicators are best to measure the social outcomes of restoration and also what indicators are best to capture the changes in institutions and the changes in the governance. So that's what we are going to look at. Um, so we start first with reviewing a bunch of those indicators, the ones that are available, and also thinking about the ones that are not available that we can um, um, think of. So that will be a first part. And then set up, um, hopefully, a, a, a big proposal where we will make the case for the importance of measuring what restoration is achieving on the ground. In Africa, we have 34 countries that have pledged to restore their lands, and all of them have commitment, millions of hectares that they want to restore, which is good. Some of them, and there are different levels of implementation. Some of them have started with projects, others are even yet to start. So we want to use the case of Malawi, which is one of the champions, we say, in restoration. And Malawi is policy a big barrier to this at this point or is it something that's actually aiding in it or is it a neutral a neutral thing at this point so the policy environment is very conducive uh, in as far as uh, forest landscape restoration is concerned when malawi um pledged to restore their land the degraded land they uh, follow up with uh, elaborating what they call the national strategies for forest landscape restoration. That was, um, so that's the, the main policy when it comes to restoration. But that has, that policy, the forest landscape restoration strategy is linked to existing sectoral policies like forest policies, uh, land, land and water conservation policies, agricultural policies. There is, um, an analysis of how aligned those are and where they're not aligned, how to address those in the in a way that can help to um, make forest landscape restoration um, something that can happen. So in addition to that strategy, they also elaborated what the national monitoring strategy. And this our particular our research project is going to um, connect to that monitoring strategy because the monitoring strategies has proposed it's hundreds of numbers of indicators that are important to uh, measure in order to say, okay, we have pledged to restore 10, uh, a certain number of hectares. We made an initial baseline assessment and we know what we need to restore. We have made uh, sure to earn some projects that are now doing restoration. How can we measure what those projects are doing in order to inform where we are, how much have we restored, and where are we going? So our projects intends to help answer those questions by not only refining those indicators that are part of the strategies, but uh, also making sure that um, the indicators that will be measured are relevant to the context, relevant to the infrastructure capacity that is there. Because when we talk about indicators, we talk about measurement, we talk about metrics it is difficult to measure them. Do we have the, what do we need to measure and how, with what tool, and we can create a whole monitoring system to propose to the countries. So that's the link to the policy from this research. And it's a long-term process. And we, hopeful, we are hopeful that um, when we get a proposal out of this um, small seed grant, and we were able to, to define what, what indicators are important to inform the restoration that is being done. We can put together a system of monitoring that will include those indicators, appropriate tools to make those indicators and 
um, and and then all in a, in a whole in a holistic system that we will propose to the um, government um, in order to inform the monitoring system. So that's the ambition of this project. For, for me, especially being the PI of, on, on this seed grant, success looks, uh, for me, it's on two, at two levels. First of all, uh, making sure we, um, like we said, we want to do a literature review out of the seed grant and, and uh, seed collaboration, which I've, I've traveled to Malawi to, to start working on and have the infrastructure in place to conduct more uh, uh, research. So hope achieving all of that is one success. The second one is to be able to write that proposal that will uh, make the case of uh, to collect or uh, to measure all of those indicators for monitoring and to be able to um, develop a monitoring system out of this. So, and through that, train um, people, right? So that we have the educational um, um, aspect. So hopefully we can get um, students who will do the PhD out of this, the, that bigger proposal. Um, yeah, so for me, that, that's what success looked like. Yeah, in addition to that, I would just add that success will mean getting those results that we have talked about and inform policy so that the issues of degradation and the issues of climate change and admittedly livelihoods are dealt with or we begin to deal with through this study. Uh, the issue of monitoring that she's talked about is very key uh, for all those that are involved in restoration in Malawi. And we are saying this is a study that uh, we believe will give those kind of results so that policymakers can make informed decisions. This is not a project that will only benefit like um, the African context, mm -hmm. right? Because um, hopefully those indicators, when we talk about, when we bring them into um, the um, academic, you know, um, um, environment, they can also inform beyond Africa because there are also countries that are doing restoration, even in the US, uh, in, in, in Latin America, in India. And the indicators monitoring, like we said, is important. So if we, are, we can inform monitoring, uh, what indicators, what tool is appropriate, this will not only be useful for Africa, for Malawi, for Africa, but beyond that. Thank you so much. Thank you both for just taking time uh, and, and, and coming and talking about this project, the challenges that Malawi and other countries are facing. Thank you so much, Kevin, for having us. It's a pleasure to um, have this opportunity to talk about the project. Thank you so much, Kevin, for having us. It was really a pleasure talking about our work. This has been season four, episode three of Growing Impact. Thanks again to Ida Jenonten, Tong Chong, and Judith Komoto for speaking with me about their research. To read the transcript from this episode and to learn more about the research team, visit iee.psu.edu slash podcast. Once you're there, you'll find previous podcast episodes, related graphics, and so much more. Join me again next month as we continue our exploration of Penn State research and its growing impact. Thanks for listening.